Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the essential works for beginners of Composer X. And Composer X is Mozart. Now, Mozart is a chore. I say that straight out for me, not for you, for me. Why? Well, because first of all, he wrote a ton of music and he wrote a ton of masterpieces, and he wrote a ton of stuff that's really very nice and very pretty. It's never less than very pretty, but still not one of the masterpieces. And we have to sort of distinguish, and that can be tricky, because of course, not everybody agrees on what the masterpieces are. I'll never forget my shock. I mean shock and horror, horror, when I was reading a, a, a masterpiece of music criticism and music, musicological insight, which is Charles Rosen's uh, The Classical Style. And he referred to the just this problem, how to differentiate great Mozart from what he said, the concerto for flute and harp, which he called Mozart's hack work, junk, just stuff he tossed off because he was an incredible genius and he could toss stuff off within this classical style, which he was instrumental in inventing after all, um, without thought. Well, that's one of the without thought pieces, however lovely it is, and it is beautiful. It's just pretty. It's recklessly pretty. But what makes the great stuff and what makes the not great stuff? Well, this is something that you, as a listener to Mozart, are going to have to determine for yourself. You're going to have to try and figure it out. But I'm going to try and give you, in this list of 10 works, some, some ideas about the things that are so characteristic of Mozart um, that you might not be thinking of initially when you listen to it because you'll be seduced by the unbelievable loveliness of it all. So beyond the loveliness, which is reason enough, let's not kid ourselves, reason enough to listen to it, there are other qualities which are really, really special and which he had that were just amazing. And we're going to talk about them as we go rather than making a giant prelude that bores you to tears and then talking about the music because we've got 10 pieces to talk to in this list. Uh, first, Eine kleine Nachtmusik. Of course. Where else would you start? Ja, da, 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 Notice that opening tune? That's something that Mozart is a specialist at. And this is what you might call balance and proportion. And you hear it in that opening phrase. Da, 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 da. What is it about that phrase? First of all, it's catchy as hell, right? But second of all, just think about it. There are two phrases. They are rhythmically identical. The rhythm is the same for each of those two phrases. It's yum, ya, yum, ya, 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 yum. That's, that's the rhythm. And both of them do it. It does it twice. But one phrase goes up and the other phrase answers and goes down. Now, you might think, well, a million tunes do that, and a million tunes do, but Mozart was extraordinarily, extraordinarily adept at creating instantly memorable ideas that have this sense of, of symmetry. And symmetry, like, like quantum mechanics, has symmetry. It's a symmetry that's essential to his language. Something goes up, something goes down, something does this, something does that. You hear it over and over and over again in Mozart's melodic writing, that feeling of symmetry, of balanced phrasing. And that goes a long way to giving his music this the, the, the incredible poise and inevitability that it has. There's something in it that makes it sound like it's like etched out of the, the, the primal fabric of musical thought. And so right a minute right away from this, this piece that everybody knows by heart, but so seldom thinks about. And Eine Kleine Nachtmusik, as it has come down to us, um, has four movements. There may have been an introductory march. It was a serenade. So usually they had more than four movements. But as we have it, it's a string orchestra symphony, a tiny miniature symphony, a beautiful miniature symphony that has all of the formal characteristics that classical music has. You have a first movement in what's called sonata form, which has a, two themes at the beginning, and then a, a, a little tiny development section, and then and a recapitulation. It's delicious, a beautiful slow movement, a charming minuet, and a rondo finale, which has A, B, A, C, A form, basically. 
It's everything that Mozart would later do, do, later do on a much grander scale. But here you have it all in one neat, perfect little package. There's a reason why this piece is so famous and so beloved and comes across as sort of the, the apotheosis musical perfection in miniature. So that's where you start. Give it a shot and listen to it, not just for its familiarity, but think. Think while you're listening. There's always a little bit more in Mozart than initially meets the ear. And that justifies repetition, of course. You'll hear new things every time you listen to it. So next, Symphony Number no. 40 in G minor. Now, this is, this is one of Mozart's big symphonic masterpieces. It's the one that goes da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. And it's another one of those, those issues of symmetry. If you listen to the opening tune, it's da 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 sense. You can be just as deep and be happy as you can when you're sad. But Mozart had a particular gift for expressing a certain pathos in his minor key writing, and G minor was his favorite minor key. It was the one where we often hear that pathos come out very, very powerfully. A sort of sub one is D minor, but G minor was like the one we think of when we think of Mozart in minor keys, largely because of this symphony. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. I mean, really gorgeous. And when listening to this symphony, the important thing, I think, to keep in mind isn't just the balance of things, but it's also the fact that there's this feeling of emotional uh, anxiety, this tension that never quite, quite breaks through the surface of the music. The music has a beautifully unruffled surface for the most part, but you you hear the the anxiousness, you hear the emotion welling up, um, and that's sort of, uh, that, that suppressed, it's not suppressed because that would sound like it's inhibited, and Mozart is never inhibited. It really isn't, but it's, it, 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 it's somehow under, under control in a way. Mozart's music is always controlled, beautifully controlled. But in order to give that feeling of, of agitation, of sadness, of pathos, Mozart's handling of minor keys was, was pretty remarkable because he was so into balance. When you're into sonata form, you may remember that, that sonata form movements begin with a, an exposition, and the exposition usually has two key areas with their themes in them. Then you have a development section, and then you have a recapitulation that's supposed to repeat everything in the home key. But the classical period was a period of musical happiness for the most part, and the enlightenment and whatnot. And so in minor key works, it, it, was, it was customary to finish even if you should go back to the home key in the minor, it was customary to finish a movement or a work in a happy major key. That is to turn G minor to G major and end cheerfully. Mozart doesn't do that. Mozart preserves with rigorous logic the idea of remaining in that home key. And as a result of that, his music has that extra sense of, of darkness and also inexorability that that, yeah, there's, there's darkness, but there's logic to the darkness. It could not be any other way. And you hear that very, very clearly in this symphony, in the first movement, in the minuet, and, and in the finale. The finale also has what's called a rocket theme. Notice the phrasing there. It's very similar to the two-part phrasing in the beginning of the whole symphony. That symmetry. Mozart's in the closet. Let him out, let him out, let him out. Oh, Mozart's in the closet. Let him out, let him out, let him out. You know, that's that you've got the, again the balance and symmetry of phrasing within a, a, a very powerful um, but logical expressive trajectory. And so there you have symphony number 40 in a nutshell, right? Now all you got to do is listen to it, which is going to be so much more more valuable than me talking about it. Trust me there. Next, the divertimento in E-flat for string trio. And I have the Kerschel listing here. What is it? Kerschel, Kerschel, 
563. Now, 563 is Kershaw 563. That means Mozart's catalog. Kershaw was the guy who put together the Mozart catalog. So pieces that would otherwise be impossible to find have K numbers that let you know you're getting the right piece of music. This is an extraordinary work. This is another aspect of Mozart's art. And, and I, I can only call it bigness, grandiosity. Mozart, you know, remember in Amadeus when when he's doing the abduction from the Seraglio, the emperor says, oh, yeah, it's great, but it has too many notes. And Mozart says, well, which notes should I take out? We mean too many notes. Mozart had a lot of notes. Mozart wrote in large scale forms. And this little divertimento for string trio lasts about 50 minutes and has uh, five or six, I think six movements or something. It's five movements, six movements, I think. It's big. It's really big. The fact that it's only written for three string instruments, a violin, a viola, and a cello, has nothing to do with the size and ambition of the music. It's one of the most extraordinary creations anybody ever came up with. It requires a different kind of listening because three string instruments are not going to give you the same kind of coloristic variety and dynamic range as a full orchestra. So you have to focus on the musical materials ever more intently, which are Gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful, wonderful melodies and tunes. One of the reasons that Mozart's music tends to be grand in size is because his musical material consists almost entirely of vocal melodies, fully formed vocal melodies, which are based on, as we've heard, these symmetrical phrases. And you can get very long tunes that way. And when you're dealing with very long tunes, especially in slow tempos and also in quick ones, the music becomes longer. It's simple logic, very simple. It's, it's physics. It's, it's just, that's the way it goes. And so Mozart's materials are these beautiful melodies. And for him to give us full exposure and treatment of his beautiful melodies, you wind up with rather large pieces of music. And this string trio is just incredible. And I, I do not be afraid of the fact that it's chamber music. I mean, that chamber music is kind of snooty in the classical music world. It's supposed to be for elite people who have strange, strange ways of hearing and their brains function differently. Nonsense. This is vintage, vintage Mozart great Mozart. And it's an amazing piece. There is no string trio in history, which is bigger than this one. This is it. This is like the limit of string triosity. And it's an amazing piece of music. So that's something worth listening to and keeping in mind too, that bigness of style that we hear in Mozart. Next, okay, get ready, folks. We have to do an opera, The Marriage of Figaro. Now, if you hate operatic voices, if the idea of listening to something that's like three hours long in Italian makes you crazy, don't worry. Don't worry. No need to take tackle this one now. But I put it in there because Mozart was the the first great opera composer whose works have never left the repertoire. From the day these things were written, people were playing them and they still are. So they date from the 1780s. And wowie wowie, they started a revolution in terms of characterization, subtlety, excellence of text and, and relationship between text and music. The librettist Lorenzo da Ponte was a genius in his own right. And Mozart developed his concept of opera gradually. I mean, there's a zillion operas before we get to The Marriage of Figaro, including The Abduction from the Seraglio and Ida Mineo and some others, which are also marvelous, do not get me wrong. But The Marriage of Figaro is a watershed in the history of opera. And it just has wonderful characters experiencing real feelings in spite of the silliness of the situations in which they find themselves. Now, when I say real feelings, this is, we mean this in an operatic sense because, because you know, people singing at each other for two and a half hours is not normal. And you have to get used to the conventions of the period. You know, when they are talking, they are singing over a light harpsichord and string accompaniment called a continuo. And it's what they're doing is recitative. And then the, the action stops and then they sing an aria. And I, I can't go into all of the details. And I don't really think I need to because the music really does speak for itself. The point is not that that the characters are real. Everyone, you'll hear it. Everyone is real flesh and blood characters talking about real emotions. It's that Mozart takes them seriously. 
He takes them seriously as actual people in these absurd situations. And so he gives them music, which is expressively true. When the aria is sad, it's sad. When it's happy, it's happy. When it's, you know, you, you listen to the words, which you have to follow and pay attention to, and listen to the music and how these characters are singing about it. And the music is a believable expression of the sense of the text. That's what we mean by, by real characters, real flesh and blood characters. And then the interactions between them are surprisingly natural. Actions happen, the repercussions are what they are. It makes sense within its own operatic twisted logic. <laughs> but you will get used to. So so I would urge you to take your time at it, but you cannot list the essential Mozart without throwing in some operas. You must, you have to, and so I did. Next, the clarinet quintet. Oh, what a gorgeous work. Now Mozart invented the clarinet. I mean, no, he didn't. I mean, it was around for you know, centuries, but he discovered the clarinet as, as a, an instrument, as a solo instrument, and as a feature of his orchestral textures. It was a Mozart specialty. He loved the clarinet above all other wind instruments. And he reserved it quite often in his operas for ex the expression of love. He loved its liquid, sexy sonority and used it in his love music. It's really, if you study Mozart or you listen or get to know his operas very well and other arias and vocal music, you will find clarinets whenever the subject of love comes up, if he had them, if he had them available. And his clarinet quintet, which is written for a clarinet with a string quartet, is incredibly beautiful. I mean, you may recall it was it was the the music that uh, sort of permeated the final the final episode of the sitcom MASH. Remember MASH at the end? They're, you know, they, they what, what's his name? Uh, uh, you know, David Patrick Stearns, not David Patrick Stearns, whatever, whatever the, that actor was who was who was the Boston Brahmin guy was teaching um, some native musicians to play Mozart's clarinet quintet because the music is just that gorgeous and wistful and nostalgic and sad while at the same time being insanely beautiful. Um, and so that's one of those things you need to understand about Mozart's handling of orchestral timbre, his love for the clarinet. Next, Piano Concerto Number 21. It's subtitled Elvira Madigan, based on a movie that nobody's seen, except for some of you people who I know have seen it, um, a Swedish film. And it's actually a very good film, by the way. But, but the concerto was Mozart's orchestral specialty. He was an amazing pianist. He wrote 27 piano concertos over the course of his career, mostly for himself to play. Um, they are exquisite and gorgeous pieces. This one actually is famous for that beautiful slow movement. Da, 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 ya, da, 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 da. You know that tune? That's in the middle movement. That's why it's so famous. But this is a military concerto. It uses trumpets and drums. Um, which in those days you used to get from your local armory. And so it's an amazing piece of music in that sense, too. It begins with a march. Dum, bum, 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 ba, da, da, dum. Ba, dum, bum, 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 ba, ba, da, da, dum. Yeah. I mean, so, so you have to keep in mind not just the Elvira Madigan part, the beautiful slow movement in the middle, which is one of the most classic and iconic versions of vocal music transferred to an instrumental format. It's a song without words. But otherwise, um, you've got a pretty, a pretty expansive and extravagant and colorful concerto in which the piano is a character, as in Mozart's operas. It's a character with its own personality trading information and and melodies and tunes and ideas with the rest of the orchestra. And the relationship between the piano and the orchestra is something that Mozart worked out in the forms of the classical concerto. And there was no one to compete with him in writing concertos until Beethoven's piano concertos and violin concerti popped up later. There aren't many great concerti in the classical form that Mozart invented with a big long introduction for the orchestra alone with the soloist entering with its own material, with the two kind of negotiating the terms of their arrangement as the movement goes on. That was all Mozart. Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, and a couple other composers, very, very few. And the majority of great classical concertos are by Mozart. 
um, and there his piano concerti and his his symphony concertante for violin and viola, which we will talk about momentarily. And you just need to get to know them because they are exquisite and marvelous pieces of music um, that are very, very special. The only issue in listening to his piano concertos is that because he wrote them for himself, the piano parts sound to modern ears somewhat thin. I mean, we're used to like, you know, Beethoven's Emperor that begins with the piano and you know, like that. Or Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto, bong, 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 you know, that sort of thing. You don't hear that in Mozart. The forte piano that he had in his day was a smaller instrument of more limited compass, and the and his piano parts he would have ornamented probably considerably in performance. And so performers are asked to add things or not, depending on how you know fearful they are of attempting that and mucking up what Mozart wrote. And I would be very afraid, frankly. So, so you should keep that in mind. But that also makes different performances worth listening to because different players will play the solo parts very, very differently. And they're, ex I said exquisite, forget exquisite. Everyone calls Mozart exquisite. You know, he is, he is. But I should stop using the same words over and over again. The music speaks more eloquently than my vocabulary. I just have to, you know, please forgive me. Next, the Grand Partita. Now, the Grand Partita is the greatest ever work for woodwinds. Woodwind ensemble. It's a woodwind serenade, just like the Divertimento is for string trio or Eine Kleine Nacht music is a tiny serenade. This is a big sucker. Again, it's, it's an hour long, roughly, for 13 wind instruments. It's amazing. Mozart was the king of wind instrument writing, which was a big deal in the classical era because most aristocratic homes, even if they could not afford to keep a full orchestra, had on staff a wind ensemble. Now, these people would also do other things. They could be butlers or, you know, servants, or they were in the army, in the barracks, they did, you know, but they played, they played oboes, horns, bassoons, clarinets, things like that. And so Mozart wrote this enormous piece. We have no idea why. And it's just amazing. This is the piece that in Amadeus, um, Salieri hears initially, and it freaks him out so much. You know, the slow movement with the beautiful oboe solo, it freaks him out so much that he decides to kill Mozart. That's the grand partita. And uh, it's an extraordinary work, a brilliant piece of music for an ensemble that many people would not be as familiar with as we are the full orchestra because it has no strings. Well, actually, usually it has like a double bass on the bottom or a cello, something to, to give the bass line a little extra a little extra zots, but otherwise it's all woodwinds and wow, what a piece of music. Now we do another opera, which we have to talk about. Mozart's most famous after the marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni. Now Don Giovanni is, is another just iconic work. And of course the story is very well known. He runs around seducing everybody until he gets sucked down to hell. And the sucking scene um, used to be uh, the end of the opera. Um, because people thought that the funny ending that comes after the sucking scene when he gets sucked down to hell was was superficial and scurrilous. But Mozart was mostly an opera a composer of comic opera. That was the language of classical music, the language of Italian comic opera. And Don Giovanni takes that language and does indeed raise it to an entirely new level of expressive angst I mean, the libretto by De Ponte is also one of the miracles of, of, of operatic librettoness because it has these enigmatic characters who are very, very morally questionable, all of them, one way or another. I mean, they have their issues. And, and the story, and Don Giovanni himself is a complete cipher. Nobody really knows what motivates him. He doesn't really have much to sing um, by himself. There are no reflective arias. This is who I am. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is how I feel. You only understand him in terms of the image of the other characters, the way the other characters interact with them and how they respond to whatever they think he represents. It's really a fascinating piece. And that sucking scene is, is, is the epitome of classical darkness. It's actually based on or inspired by the same scene in Gluck's ballet, Don Juan, um, which has the famous Dance of the Furies as its sucking scene. It was a ballet. 
but it's very, very gripping. And Mozart with Don Giovanni, even the very beginning of the overture, really invented horror movie music, spooky music, atmospheric music. There's a relationship between the music and the text which is closer than anyone else had attempted up to that point in some respects, in many respects, actually. It's, it's, it, there's this incredible feeling of, of claustrophobic dread from the very beginning of the opera, even though it's a comedy and has very funny moments in it. It really does. But there you go. So if you've done The Marriage of Figaro, you might want to start with Don Giovanni because in some ways it's the simpler piece, expressively speaking. You know, the gut-wrenching darkness parts are really pretty obvious as composed to the more witty and sophisticated um, undercurrent in The Marriage of Figaro. But, oh my goodness, what a work. And again, it's like three hours and you got to take your time and it's there because it has to be there and you're going to want to know it. I guarantee that when you're ready, it will, it will knock your socks off. So you have two more works. Are you ready? The String Quartet, String Quintet, I'm sorry, Mozart wrote String Quartet, some beautiful ones, but this is the String Quintet, number three in C major. Now, Mozart wrote masterpieces in all of the chamber music genres that he attempted. There are piano trios, there are violin sonatas, there's all kinds of stuff. But his greatest chamber works are his string quintets. There are six of them, an early one and five later ones. And the one in C major is one of the largest and most jolly pieces that he ever wrote. It's really quite amusing and, and full of great tunes. And I don't need to go into it in huge detail. It's another one of those works that proves, as does the string trio, that chamber music is not, is not small music. The string quintet is just huge. It's ample and it's expansive and it's, it's, it's easy going and it's just full of delightful musical events that you'll discover for yourself. I can't go into them in detail here, but I need to point out the quintets as a group because when you start to listen and love chamber music, and you will, I guarantee it, you are going to want to get the best of Mozart's chamber music, and that is the quintets. His quartets are justly famous. The most famous of them are the six quartets dedicated to Haydn, which are not on this list. They are harder to listen to, I think, than the quintets. They're, they're also extremely, extremely intricate. Mozart was, was working his damnedest to be worthy of his model, which was Haydn, of course, um, and he wrote great works in the string quartet medium, but they are not the same as the quintets because Mozart, Mozart had a great love of, of rich sounds, of sonority, and I think having that extra viola, because it's a violin, two violas, and two, uh, two violins, two violas, and a cello, that's what they are, pardon me, um, uh, he was able to relax just a little bit and maybe have a little bit more fun in the writing and I think these works are simply more ingratiating and more expressively immediate than the string quartets. But that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the quartets. There isn't. They're just a, a, in a different style, I think, um, in terms of Mozart's own musical development. And I, I, I think we should, uh, for this essential list, I mean, the list of essential works, you, you got to have a quintet. You just got to have a quintet. And last but not least, another concerto type piece. This is the Symphony Concertante in E flat for violin and viola. It has a Kerschel number. It's a, it's, a, it's a fairly early-ish one. I think it's Kerschel three something, but I, you know, I didn't even write it down here. Ah, who cares? Um, it's, there's only one Symphony Concertante for violin and viola. There is another one for woodwind instruments, which may not even be entirely by Mozart, so I would kind of skip that one for now. But the Symphony Concertante, what is a Symphony Concertante? A Symphony Concertante is simply, it's a concerto for more than one instrument. That's all it is. This is a three movement concerto, the soloist or a violin and a viola. It's an, a glorious piece of music. It's Mozart's greatest concerto for stringed instruments because although he played the violin quite well and he wrote five violin concertos, those are quite early. Um, they're not as fully developed or as interesting as his piano concertos. And the one concerto for stringed instruments is this one and it's unique. It's unique in Mozart's output and it's pretty much unique in the realm of symphony concertante-ness. I mean, there are probably other works out there for violin and viola, but no one really cares about them, even if they exist. So, so this is one of those Mozart originals a piece that only he could have written and written at the level that he does. Oh, it has such wonderful tunes. Yeah, da 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 oh. you, could, you could hum the whole thing. You really could. And with that, 
we come to the end of our list of 10 essential Mozart works that I think really give you the essence of the composer, of the man, of what he did. And there will be, of course, other people who have other opinions, um, and they are free to express them. But I guarantee that if you take your time, as I say in all of these lists, and really make a point of getting to know these pieces, then you will really be in great shape as regards Mozart. And you'll know very quickly if he's the composer for you, or if you may want to come back, try him later. And as usual, you can get recommendations for all of these pieces at classicstoday.com and in the Mozart playlist, where I talk about a lot of these works as well, independently. So there you go, my friends. I got to just turn you loose now and have all the confidence in the world that you don't need to know anything else in order to enjoy this music to the max. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me and take care.